everybody. Welcome to today's episode of Tomorrow's Leader, where we dive deep on all things leader-related, related to leading yourself and leading others. I'm John Larito, your host today on this magical April day. Uh, just coming back from a phenomenal vacation with my kiddos in Maui, Hawaii. For those of you who have not been to Hawaii, especially Maui, make this a absolute goal at some point in your life to get out there. It is unbelievable. I mean, I got to say. We came back. For those of you who are Facebook friends of mine, you'll see all my pictures on Facebook. And I even look at the pictures and I'm like, God, they do not, as beautiful as they are, it does not do it justice. It is just this place where you can go and it soak up the the scenery and the vibes and everything. It is just the most relaxing place ever and truly breathtaking views. Uh, for those of you who have been there, you know what I'm talking about, especially the Road to Hana. And my recommendation is if you go, Try to do your best to not only go to the road to Hana, that's a beautiful uh, journey. It's not the destination, it's the journey, which is incredible. All these windy roads, I think it's 100 and, 167 curves or maybe 627 curves. I don't know, something like that. Somewhere in between 167 and 627 curves. It's a windy road. And uh, with like just, you know, sheer cliffs on both sides, uh, on, on one side. And uh, you finally get to the road to Hana and it's just this cute little town. Nothing significant. It's just the whole journey to get there. But most people turn around and come back, which is a full day, you know, to, to the road to Hana and back. But if you keep going around, you go through this area called the upcountry, which is indescribable. I can't even. I can't even tell you about it. It is unbelievable. Uh, you get to this one. We, the kids and I rented a Jeep, which was awesome. And you round this curve. And again, these sheer cliffs at this point on this side of the island, there are literally no guardrails. So you got to be careful. Uh, it is scary at some points, but it is worth it. It is unbelievable. We rounded a corner. And again, you're seeing waves crashing against these beautiful rock cliffs and everything. And you round a corner and there was this rainbow. I mean, like, I'm not talking about an, an everyday rainbow. Like this thing, it was like it was painted in the sky and we were driving into it. It was like it was right in our car. Like we were in the middle of the rainbow. It was unbelievable. Um, it's amazing. We had so many great times. And I even asked the kids, I'm like, afterwards, at the end of the week, I always say, what was your favorite part of the, the trip? They're like, you know, that moment we saw the rainbow was like unbelievable. And it's true. Like, literally, I felt the same way. I'm like, yeah, you know, that was like just it was truly breathtaking. So if you're a Facebook friend of mine, take a look at the picture. You'll see. Uh, and if you're not, send me an invite. I'll be a faithful. We'll be Facebook friends, Facebook buds. Uh, so in any event, um, and um, where was I going with that? Well, anyways, I'm back. So back here, I know what I was going to say is I know there's been a little gap here. I tried my best to record up till like two in the morning before I left on the trip and uh, got some episodes out. But now I'm back in action with all kinds of topics I want to talk about. So in any event, OK, today, what do I want to talk about? I want to talk about something that pertains to all leaders leading an organization, especially large organizations. We do our best to run organizations and, and companies that are thriving, that are successful, that are full of happy people, that feel great, and a really positive culture. But at the same point, as a leader, we're challenged with having to make decisions sometimes that are really tough decisions. We can't please everybody, and that's not the way to be a leader is to try to please everybody all the time. You're just not going to do that. So ultimately, you have in every organization a certain percentage of people or a certain amount of people that are unhappy or maybe complaining or upset or whatnot about whatever various issues it may be. So I've always looked at something called what I call the moan index. And it helps me as a leader. And when I work with other leaders, it helps them become conscious of what's really happening, get a good pulse on the organization and avoid the very common mistakes that leaders tend to make in regard to complaints or dissatisfaction or general levels of moaning in an organization. And that is either to over respond uh, and misinterpret some type of feedback or complaint 
or to totally ignore it than something that should not be ignored. So the Moan Index is a way for you to become conscious of ultimately what is the real level of discontent in an organization. And again, my point here is to not to say that there should be none. If you've got all happy people in the organization, that's not necessarily a good sign. Because at times, again, as a leader, you need to make tough decisions. You need to ultimately move in different directions. It's going to create discomfort for people. There may be people that want to hang on to the old way of doing things. There's all kinds of issues that could cause people to complain about stuff. Even people that are ultra happy and extremely excited and very, very uh, intent on staying with your organization for many, many years, there will always be things that they can point to that they're maybe not happy with. That's okay. That's not That's not bad necessarily. Uh, it's just getting a really good understanding of what that is, what things you need to take action on and what things you need to maybe not take action on, what things you maybe need to just lend an open ear to, and what things you may in some cases need to take some drastic and quick action on. So here's the Moan Index. It really comes down to four different factors. The first one is volume, which is what percentage of your organization is complaining right now? Which, what percentage of your organization is unhappy? And, and, and how I measure that, you can measure that in a lot of different ways. You can do different people surveys and confidential types of surveys. You can measure it just based on the people that have voiced their discontent. Whatever way you're, and part of this is to measure it against the baseline and see your trend as an organization. But what percentage of the population is unhappy. The next factor is the rate. So how frequently are complaints being lodged or how frequently are you hearing discontent when you ask people how things are going, how frequently are they bringing up the problems that they're bringing up or negative things versus positive things. So that's the second thing is the rate of complaints or discontent that you're hearing and soliciting and ultimately coming across. The third measure is the intensity. So when people complain, how, what's the intensity of it? I mean, is it truly, uh, you know, is it, is it, are they at their wits end? You know, are they ready to leave? Are they've just dealt with this so much? They're just, you know, they're all time at a high level of anger, frustration, yelling. I mean, is that, is it that intense? Is it, a general level of, hey, I'm really not happy with this and it's been a persistent problem, but they're more, you know, it's contained. It's not, it's not an exasperated, frustrated, I'm ready to walk out. Or is it the type of thing where it's thinking, 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 and yeah, I guess so, by the way, yeah, this is, you know, this is an issue. They really have to think about whether it's really a complaint. It's not something that naturally comes to mind. So on a scale of one to 10, what's the intensity of the complaints that you're hearing? How really worked up are people about whatever it is that they're complaining about? That's the third measure. And then the fourth one is what is the significance? What is the actual complaint about and how significant is the complaint? Uh, and for those of you watching on YouTube, you see my light just went out. Well, okay, interesting. Uh, and by the way, quick aside, anybody that's a lighting expert, uh, you can see I got all kinds of stuff going on here in my studio with lights coming in, window lights and all this stuff. Uh, I'm, I'm more than open to feedback on how I can light this place better. I'm in the process of redoing my studio here. You're going to see a whole different backdrop in a, in a short period of time. But anyways, uh, quick aside, my lighting just blew out on me. So I, I'm not, I'm visible, but not as bright and you can't see every, uh, zit on my face here anymore. So Anyway, um, so uh, where was I? So significance of the complaint. So what is it that actually people are complaining about? Uh, you know, is it that their beefs that they have are things that are genuinely getting in the way of them doing more business? Uh, is it beefs? Is it complaints and concerns that they have about the culture that they find that is, is either threatening to them or not safe? Okay, these are major, major issues, right? Are the complaints the fact that they don't like the coffee uh, or, you know, the carpeting in the building that they don't like uh, or that, um, you know, the lights are, are the wrong shade of color, whatever? You know, these are minor things. Now, what I will say is as a leader, sometimes you have easy opportunities to put a deposit into the emotional bank account 
with somebody by fixing some of these insignificant problems that really may not be very big in your mind, but for some reason they're big in their mind, and it's a relatively easy fix. You know, if I had somebody that was complaining about lights and it's an easy light bulb change, you know, it may not be anything I'm concerned about, but hey, if it's something that's bothering them and it's an easy fix, okay, why not? Why not do it? I love the show Ted Lasso. Great, great show. Great leadership show. And if, you, if you've if you watched this, there's one scene at the beginning when Ted takes over the team, and this is a really frustrated, classic kind of turnaround job. So if you're, if you're a leader that's taken over an organization that's struggled, that has been struggling, and your job now is to come in and turn this around, this is a great series about the whole concept of leadership, turnaround leadership. I got to do podcasts on this on the whole leadership lessons from Ted Lasso. But one of them, at the beginning, Jamie complains as the captain of the team, I think at that time it was, uh, about some of the issues that they have and they're griping about. And one of the things on the list is the fact that the water pressure in the shower uh, sucks. And he's like, you know, he's really frustrated about it. And, you know, Ted's like, okay, well, what the heck? But it was interesting because of all this list, that was one of the first things that Ted did is he brought somebody in to fix the water pressure of the shower. Now, a coach could have said, and Ted could have said, well, you know, what's the big deal? Does that really affect your play on the field? I mean, is that the reason why we're not winning games? No, it's not. So forget about it. Just don't worry about it. Just, you know, suck it up. It would be easier for, easier for a coach to say that and rationalize not taking action. But here was an easy thing. And he did take that step. He fixed the water pressure. He didn't even say anything about it. He just let the players come and take a shower. And all of a sudden, they're like, wow. And it was the first realization. It was a major positive deposit into the emotional bank accounts of the players. Because they realized for the first time they have a leader that actually cares about them. Most leaders would have brushed it aside. Well, what, what, it doesn't even matter. It doesn't contribute to our game. What, I mean, what are you talking about? Water pressure? Go home and take a shower. But here was somebody who took their complaint serious, even though it would have been easy for him not to. He did something quickly, and it had a major impact. That's called leverage, right? The small things you can do to create a massive difference. And that started to earn the trust level of the players. The play, bottom line, people, what do people want in a leader? They want somebody who cares about them, who truly wants to help them, that they know has their best interest at heart, and who's competent, and who will actually do stuff and can get stuff done. Well, that just satisfied at least three of those, you know, fix the water. He, they, may, they, they know nothing about his coaching, but they sure as heck know that he cares about them and that he really uh, wants to help them and, and truly wants to put them in a better place and that he can get stuff done. I mean, that says a lot. That builds the trust. Now they're open to his coaching and his leadership more than ever. So brilliant little thing that he did to pave the way for lots of success moving forward. So look for those things. I mean, honestly, truly look for them. Don't just let them come to you, but look for those little, easy, solvable things that may even be, you know, insignificant, but bigger on the intensity scale. You know, those are the things, those easy fixes that can really, really go a long way. So let's review again. So these four things, volume, what percentage of your organization is complaining right now or unhappy? Rate, how frequently are they complaining? Uh, Intensity, what's the intensity when you're hearing this this, uh, discontent? And then lastly is the significance. What is the issue itself that they're complaining about? How big of a deal really is it? And how much does it impact their ability to do their job and contribute to the overall vision and mission of the organization? Bottom line, what I look at is these four things and it helps me assess, do I need to take action? And if so, what does that action look like? Okay, I don't wanna over respond. I see leaders do this all the time. I I saw a, a... there was a, a great business meeting that a company put on, a full day meeting, and it was for seven or 800 people. At the end of that full day, uh, there was feedback given, and it prompted the person the next day to make a comment to it, almost apologizing for what the specific feedback was in regard to. And I, I remember asking the leader afterwards and talking about it, and it turned out of those seven or 800 people, it was one person, one person 
who gave that feedback. Now, the other 799 must have, might, might have thought phenomenally, thought great, that one person was loud and voiced the opinion and ended up causing this leader to make a comment that then might have even swayed the opinion of other people. So ultimately, that's ultimately what caused this, this change. So my point is you have to be very conscious of where that feedback is coming from. And, and is it a loud but very small portion of your organization, in which case it can feel like it's a larger portion? We've all been there before. You know, you've got 2% of the organization that makes it feel like it's 20 or 30%, okay? You've got to be careful. You've got to look at that, okay? And again, my message in this podcast is not to ignore, but simply to be conscious of what tr what is the true scenario here? Because I can get overly swayed by positive feedback. I can hear the things I want to hear and turn a blind eye to the things I don't want to see. Uh, or, and I can look for supporting documents and comments to support my own beliefs. That's a bias. That's a cognitive bias. Or I can get swayed the other way, right? I can easily get influenced by the people that are influential, that might have a louder voice or be more apt to give me that feedback. As a leader, that can be a really difficult trap almost that you fall into and it's a slippery slope. And then it affects the, your leadership of the rest of the organization. So I could be rolling out a program a new program, I might have 20 people involved in this, and I might have one or two people that give negative feedback, which as a relatively new leader, that could give me the impression that, oh, wow, this program must think. Maybe ever, I assume everybody else feels that same way. Don't assume that. That's not necessarily the case. So we have to listen. We've got to ask questions and get the true scoop. How, what percentage of your organization is unhappy versus happy? And again, what, when I say rate, I've always taken a look and said, okay, are people complaining more? Are things happening? Are people, is, am I hearing more complaints more frequently? If that's the case, that's not a good thing, right? If I've got the same percentage of people that are unhappy, but they're complaining more frequently, well, things are moving in a bad direction. Less frequently, okay, moving in a more positive direction. If they're getting louder and angry or more frustrated, that's a problem. If these issues go from being small things to more significant things, that's a problem. You know, I had a leader once that um, was was p picking on something with me uh, that was really, really small. And I realized at that point, this was when I was a new advisor and it was like our new leader rather. And there were like 10 things that I had to do as a leader and I was doing very well. I was ranked number one in the in a market group in the region at, in that role. And nine of those things they were doing really well, but it was number 10 that I was not. And I was not doing well. And he just chose to really make a big deal about that. Now, part of that is good. He was kind of that perfectionist and just nitpicking and driving on everything. And it forced me to become, I think, in a lot of ways, a better leader. But it also helped me to be conscious of that. And I almost took that as a compliment. I'm like, okay. If that's what he has to look for and ultimately get to to have a complaint or an issue about me, all right, that's not a bad thing. Granted, he's just not the type that's going to give me all the positive feedback on the other nine things that I'm doing great. But I can almost in my own mind reframe it as, hey, he just gave me a compliment because he picked on number 10. So I'm not, I'm not doing number 10 right. Well, I'm kind of going to interpret that as I'm doing one through nine really, really well because that's what he had to spend. That's how far down the list he had to go to find out something I'm doing wrong. Does that make sense? I'm hoping that makes sense. So I'm hoping this whole conversation makes sense. Again, the point is not to ignore, but it's to really understand and don't make blanket assumptions. Don't assume that because 3% or 4% or 5% of your organization is unhappy that they're representative of the whole. Don't assume that they're not at the same point. My point is get the true scoop. Find out, figure it out. You ask questions, do surveys, walk around, talk to people, at, put, make your organization one where people feel comfortable giving you feedback. Okay, I'm going to go through another episode. The next one's going to talk about how you create that environment because there's a method to that, to creating the environment where people feel like they can give you fee that type of criticism or feedback or ideas or whatnot uh, because as a leader, you control that. So, uh, that said, again, the Moan Index, the volume times the rate times the intensity times the significance of the complaints or issues or all that kind of jazz. So 
Hope that helps today. That's my message for you. I'm going to leave you with that. I hope all is going great. As always, like, share, subscribe, all that kind of good stuff. Go down below, give a five-star review, please. I need that. That helps. Believe me, I want to get this out to more and more audience members out there. And of course, I love getting calls. I've gotten a lot of calls from you recently, sharing different issues, challenges. I use that as future podcast topics. Uh, keep them coming. I've got a bunch that are lined up that I'm working on based on your feedback. So thank you and your ideas. I truly do appreciate that. I'm here for you. Have a good one. Thanks. Thank you.